Just go. So it's a, a great honor. My name is Charles Small, the director of ISGAP, and I'm really honored to uh, have back uh, Emmanuel Atologi. Actually, Emmanuel was the first person ever to speak at an ISGAP event uh, before we went to Yale. So it's nice that you're back. We've uh, had success along the road. We won't mention how long ago that yeah. was. <laughs> so, Emmanuel. Um, I'm reading off my iPhone because of more technological problems. Um, his most recent book is the Pastaran Inside Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Emmanuel is published widely. And this was released in September of 2011. Dr. Atalongi um, is an expert in various areas, including Israeli domestic policy, constitutional issues, political trends and elections, the Arab-Israeli conflict, issues of terrorism and counterterrorism, security, Italian foreign policy, and the EU's Middle East policy uh, policy making. Um, Emmanuel is the director of the Transatlantic Institute in Brussels. But I'm not. Was what? He says was. Uh, and, and was the, a professor of Israel Studies at St. Anthony's College, uh, my old alma mater at Oxford University. Emmanuel received his doctorate degree in political theory at the Hebrew University, and he did his undergraduate studies at the University of Bologna. Uh, currently, Professor Atalungi is based in Washington, where he's a research scholar, research fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of uh, Democracy very important think tank uh, in Washington. Um, Emmanuel's published widely in academic uh, journals, books, and uh, as well as uh, magazines and newspapers, uh, important newspapers. And I would just say on a personal note that Emmanuel is really one of the strong, consistent voices on Iran. Uh, unfortunately, for all of us who care about uh, justice in this realm, it seems that these are not easy times, so your work is even more, most important at this time, as Iran uh, is marching forward. And I'll just say, on a, on a, I have to say something, if you don't mind me saying. I remember I was just speaking to Emmanuel about the sort of the, the atmosphere in the United States and in Canada in the Jewish community. This is apropos to the lecture we're going to hear tonight. And I was saying how Growing up in Canada, we used to say we were very different than America, than the United States. And in the back of my mind, I always thought that uh, it's not really true that Canadian nationalists, we, we, we would say we're different because we wanted to be different. But I have to say, when I meet young students in Montreal at McGill University, and I meet uh, my nephews, our three nephews and their friends and family, there is a big difference. And the, the schism in this community, in the United States, in New York, is something uh, that is um, extraordinarily frightening to me as a Canadian Israeli living here. Uh, and it's, it's especially frightening because given the times, given this moment when 18 hours before the interim agreement was signed with the Iranian revolutionary regime, the leader of the regime basically said that Israelis and Jews and Zionists are dogs that will be obliterated. And the six countries, including the United States, went ahead without any major protest or any protest and signed an interim agreement with a regime that was basically, in addition to all its human rights violations around the world, inciting to genocide. And not only did this transpire, but our community, our community, the Jewish community, our community of scholars, our community of journalists, I, from my perspective, have been way too silent. The decoupling of human rights, basic human rights and foreign policy is very dangerous, but even more dangerous is our silence. And I think the silence, in my humble opinion, is connected to Emmanuel's talk tonight. Today, the title of the speech is Worse Than Their Enemies, Anti-Semitism Among Jews. It's sad that we have to say this, but it's a very important paper from an eminent scholar. Welcome to the Thank you.
you, uh, thank you, Charles, and uh, thank you, everyone, for, for being here. Greetings. Good evening. Uh, I'm very grateful, of course, uh, for the invitation, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, uh, as Charles mentioned, uh, I, I, uh, I gave, I think, what was the inaugural uh, seminar uh, at, at the beginning of, uh, of the road, and, uh, and I, I want to commend him and, and, uh, and Iska for, for, for your work, uh, which, uh, as you just showed me, uh, is, is uh, very important because it combines uh, scholarship and, and uh, moral clarity. Uh, so I hope uh, not to disappoint the audience uh, after such a gracious introduction. Uh, I have to forewarn you, uh, I have to go through 44 pages uh, of my paper, so um, if, you, if you disagree, hopefully you'll fall asleep. Um, but let me begin uh, my address uh, 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 by offering you a lengthy quote from uh, uh, a blogger, um, uh, Philip Weiss, who is the current co-editor and co-founder of, uh, uh, of the blog Mondo Weiss, uh, which is a trademark internet platform for news and opinions about Israel and the Middle East. Uh, Mondo Weiss defines itself in its about page in the following way, quote, Mondo Weiss is a news website devoted to covering American foreign policy in the Middle East, chiefly from a progressive Jewish perspective. It has four principal aims. One, publish important developments touching on Israel-Palestine, the American Jewish community, and the shifting debate over U.S. foreign policy in a timely fashion. Two, publish a diversity of voices to promote dialogue on these important issues. Three, to foster the movement for greater fairness and justice for Palestinians in American foreign policy. Four, to offer alternatives to pro-Zionist ideology as a basis for American Jewish identity. We maintain this blog because of 9-11, Iraq, Gaza, the Nakba, the struggling people of Israel and Palestine, and our Jewish background, end of quote. Now in this context, uh, or to fulfill this mission, uh, Weiss uh, posted a blog entry on February 17, 2008, which was entitled, quote, Do Jews dominate American media? And so what if we do? End quote. Um, I invite you to read the whole piece if you're interested in the minutiae uh, of, uh, of this argument, but let me just summarize it. He basically says, one, that Jews are overrepresented in the media, B, um, sorry, two, uh, that Jews tend to defend Israel uncritically because of peer pressure from inside the Jewish community. Three, those who dare publicly break ranks from the party line are subject to, uh, to uh, uh, being excluded and uh, banished and branded as traitors. Um, and uh, they are under a heavy pressure to conform, a pressure that he describes, quote, not that different from what Muslim women who want greater freedom undergo physically, or by evangelical Christians who want to support gay rights, end of quote. Four, they thus shield Israel from the criticism that Israel should deserve, and in the process do a disservice to the public, uh, which they misinform. And by implication, they're also uh, acting as agents for a country that is not their own. Now, Weiss would, I assume, shrug any accusation of having repeated an old anti-Jewish stereotype, or several one of them at once, actually. Um, and as an attempt to silence his criticism of Israel or of the pro-Zionist ideology, as he calls it, uh, which he wishes to supplant through his work. And blog entries of Mondo Weiss have indeed formulated this response, that anyone who criticizes them by implying that this argument is anti-Semitic is trying to silence them. Um, and of course, therefore, uh, when he uses these types of, uh, of, uh, of imagery, uh, he'll say that uh, it's not a stereotype, it's a fact. Um, and he tries to kind of make that argument. Uh, and that anyway, his criticism is not uh, anti-Semitism, just anti-Zionism. Let me explain why I think uh, he is wrong, and, uh, and that will be a good, uh, a good starting point for, for tonight's discussion. First, his argument is not based uh, on quantitative analysis of editorials and news coverage of Middle East in all dailies, weeklies, monthlies, quarterlies, electronic and print media in America. Okay, so he doesn't say, I have studied publications, 57 uh, dailies uh, measuring their influence uh, based on their readership, I have taken this list of electronic publications, I have taken the, the eight leading conservative and liberal 
um, weeklies and monthlies. I, I've looked at everybody who writes about the Middle East. That these are their names and the product of 754 authors it shows X percentage of Jews writing about this. He doesn't do that. Um, so he solves this challenge by backing his claim uh, uh, in the following way. He says, quote, I have worked for many magazines and newspapers, and for a time my whole social circles was editors and writers in New York. I don't know television, I don't know Washington journalism well, and I don't know the West Coast. My sample is surely skewed by the fact that I'm Jewish and have always felt great comfort with other Jews. But in my experience, Jews have made up the majority of the important positions in the publications I've worked for, a majority of the writers I've known at these places, and the majority of the owners who have paid me. Yes, my own sample may be skewed, but I think it shows that Jews make up a significant proportion of power positions in media, half if not more." End of quote. Now let, let's just assume for the sake of argument that had he really done the job of counting, it turned out that he was right. That, quote, the Jews, the Jews make up a significant proportion of position in the media, half if not more, end of quote. Now I'm pretty sure that he's right in one place, Israel. I think that in Israel, even without quantitative analysis, you can prove <laughs> that most Jews, most journalists writing about the Middle East are Jews. Um, but even assuming that he's right, and most uh, or many a preponderance uh, uh, of Jews are journalists writing about the Middle East, so what? It doesn't follow that because they are Jewish, they consort to hide the truth from the public, or that they have a major groupthink tendency to protect Israel from criticism, or that they cut off critics from the promising whistleblowing career they otherwise get. And let me just give you the following examples. Peter Beinert and Bill Kristol. They're both, you know, in their own right, media stars writing about Israel and the Middle East. I don't think that they write the same kind of analysis. <laughs> Roger Cohen and Charles Krauthammer, two more Jews <coughs> commenting from the pages of two leading national broadsheets, the New York Times and the Washington Post. Again, you can make the same observation. What about Max Blumenthal and Daniel Gordis, writers and essayists? Again, <laughs> And what about, since you mentioned the split in the Jewish community, Commentary Magazine and the New York Review of Books, two Jewish monthly separated by a park. Um, I don't think that they think exactly the same. That if you, sort of, if, you take, if you take these examples, and there are several ones, I don't think it turns out that all Jews sing from the same score sheet when they talk about Israel and the Middle East. And since we are in New York, let me spend one more word about the New York Times. I counted in the last 10 days three important, well-written, articulate uh, op-eds in the pages of the uh, comment section of the New York Times talking about Israel. The first was by uh, Jewish and former Israeli anti-Zionist polemicist Avi Schlein. The second was by... Uh, Palestinian uh, advocate of the uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign, Omar Barghouti. And the third was by left-wing Zionist, Mr. Hirsch Goodman. There was no Likud representative uh, arguing there. Um, and so if you take this free commentary, and of course, you know, sure, you know, two out of three were Jewish. So if you take that as a, as a representative sample, it's 67% of Jews. Uh, in the media, uh, but still, if you want to argue that the Jews control the media to, con to protect Israel and filter the story, I think that you can make a solid argument that they're doing a very sloppy job. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact, I think, is that many Jews write, edit, and opine on the Middle East doesn't mean that they always shape the debate, or as Weiss postulates, ensure that only one view is being given the privilege of a fair hearing. Again, if you think about Israel as the only place where Jews have a you know, preponderance, uh, an over-representation in the media, if you wish, or maybe no, because most of the people in Israel are Jewish. Israel is one example where most Jews who write about the Middle East disagree with each other. But anyway, the fact is also that some of the worst 
critics, critics of Israel are Jewish, and that some of the most compelling pro-Israel writers are not Jewish. Two examples, once again, Mike Duran uh, from uh, Brookings Institution uh, and Lee Smith from the Weekly Standard, uh, who also contributes frequently to Tablet Magazine. Neither of them Jewish, both of them uh, very pro-Israel. So, which way is which? And the problem, I think, if we start sort of moving aside the issue for quantitative analysis and and which Jew writes for which publication and in favor of whom in the debate over the Middle East, we have to just accept that the entire premise of the argument about Jewish influence, whatever the category, media, finance, Hollywood, you name it, rests on the anti-Semitic assumption that Jews act as a group, that they concert with one another, that they collude to promote one single view and interest, that that interest collides with the public good, and that in doing so, they are serving a country that is not their own. Now, the fact that a Jewish intellectual articulates this vision while sitting in his living room in the Upper West Side does not mitigate the fact that what he says is the repetition of an old stereotype against Jews. And the fact that he's Jewish does not shield them from calling what he wrote pure and simple anti-Semitism. Now much of the current anti-Semitism that we're witnessing in the Western world manifests itself in relation to the Middle East conflict and Israel's conduct in the region. And some Jewish voices, mostly intellectuals or academics, have responded to the latest assault on the Jewish people by often excusing it, justifying it, downplaying it, and sometimes joining it. The role of Jewish voices in present-day anti-Semitism is not just a marginal phenomenon, uh, perhaps a little eccentric uh, for, you know, for uh, you know, aficionados of research on anti-Semitism who search for a new subject. Uh, in my view, it is uh, a critical novelty in the current resurgence of anti-Jewish prejudices and one uh, that has actually earned scant attention in scholarly writings. And because it appears almost exclusively in relation to what it ad its advocates mislabel as criticism of Israel, I will focus my remarks uh, on Jewish anti-Semitism in the context of Israel and the Middle East, uh, although there are examples uh, as well from other contexts. Now, it is my contention that Jewish and Israeli intellectuals lending their voices to the demonization of Israel, sometimes Judaism, and those who support this demonization uh, serve the purpose of cancelling out any accusation of anti-Semitism that could otherwise be leveled against those who support these arguments, based on the claim that a Jew cannot be an anti-Semite. Israel's detractors readily seize upon such Jewish and Israeli censors of Israel, both as evidence of the validity of the most extreme arguments against Israel and as a shield against accusations of anti-Semitism. By citing the writings of Jewish intellectuals such as Weiss, the one I just mentioned, and others, Israel's detractors can prove that Jews argue against Israel in much the same way as they do. And since Jews are presumed to be immune from anti-Semitism, it must therefore follow that what Jews say is not anti-Semitic. By calling Jewish testimony to their defense, Israel's detractors proceed then to label their critics as censors, intent on silencing free speech. Denunciations of anti-Semitism are thereby neutralized as expressions of McCarthyism, and Jews who shield Israel's detractors from these accusations are exalted as dissidents, courageously fighting a Jewish witch hunt in the name of truth and authentic Jewish values. And this type of argument, in my view, diverts attention from the merit of any criticism of, of Israel and shifts focus on the identity of those who are formulating it. Now this line of, of reasoning validates a number of further arguments and I just want to give you some examples of how calling uh, sort of Jewish intellectuals to justify certain, certain descriptions of, of Israel um, fits this pattern. Um, Israel supporters are complicit in the cover-up of Israel's crimes, new historians being mentioned um, in a variety of sources. 
Anti-Semitism, including the Holocaust and its memory, is exploited by Jewish organizations to silence a genuine debate about Israel. Again, plenty of sources making that argument. And usually referring to Jews, one comes to mind, uh, uh, Norman Filkenstein, as an example uh, of this kind of, uh, of uh, notion. Um, the constant recourse to the accusation of anti-Semitism ends up producing a, a backlash against Jews as if to say the Jews uh, brought it upon themselves. Um, if Jews spoke out critically against Israel, it would advance peace. Again, the implication is that Jewish silence or acquiescence is an obstacle to peace, and that by being silent, Jews kind of bring upon themselves uh, the abuse that they then denounce. And that, of course, last point, Jews who break ranks with the mainstream Jewish establishment are not only courageous, but are also continuing the authentic expression of Judaism and the prophetic tradition. Now this rhetoric, which I just briefly described and in, in the paper that I have here with me, uh, I, I offer plenty of, uh, of examples, uh, is actually a discourse about saving Jews from themselves by instructing them to discard Israel from their identity or face unple unpleasant consequences uh, if they fail to do so. It is therefore, for all intents and purposes, a linguistic mandate to justify the calls for the destruction of the Jewish state, articulated and or underwritten by Jews in the name of Jewish values and for the sake of the Jewish people, and an, an instrument aimed at validating the argument that present-day demonization of Israel and anti-Semitism are therefore devoid uh, of an, an anti-Zionism are devoid of any anti-Semitism. And this is something, the role that Jews play in this is very important because we live in a world where overt anti-Semitism is unacceptable in social and political discourse. I mean, if you, if you walk into a cocktail party and say, you know, Jews control Wall Street and Jews control the media and they're responsible for, uh, you know, wars and chaos, that will most likely be considered to be socially unacceptable. <coughs> at least in the Western world. Um, but if you say, you know, Israel uh, manipulates uh, public opinion in America through an overpowerful Israel lobby, uh, which silences critics and is leading America to war against its own national interest, that's not anti-Semitism anymore. And if you can say, by the way, <coughs> Mr. Rusen Blumenthalovich from down the street who prays uh, at my synagogue uh, said so, that gives even more credence to the argument. Now, the people engaged in this kind of rhetoric do not see themselves as anti-Semites. They are proud to define themselves as anti-Zionist and vigorously reject the charge that they are anti-Semitic or self-hating. Now, I want to contend that their writings and public pronouncements nevertheless fulfill the role of a powerful alibi against accusation of anti-Semitism and are used to screen the true and authentic nature of their discourse. Now, I developed my argument in my paper by uh, taking five steps. First, um, I discuss the process by which Jews embrace the discourse of anti-Semitism and I do so by, of anti-Zionism, excuse me, and I do so by relying on Professor Sander Gilman's analysis of Jewish self-hatred, and then argue that this process is at work with at least some anti-Zionist Jewish intellectuals. Second, um, I discuss the contiguity of the concepts of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism by making the case that anti-Zionism, distinct from criticism of specific Israeli actions on, on their merits, is a form of anti-Semitism, and that therefore, those Jews who proclaim their Jewishness through their hatred of Israel are indeed embracing an anti-Semitic discourse and are therefore self-hating. Three, uh, I offer uh, evidence uh, from the discourse uh, uh, on over and about Israel from these, uh, these Jewish and Israeli intellectuals, and I show that their language and their imagery stems from a desire to redefine Jewish identity according to an anti-Zionist view of Jewish history. Four, uh, I address the question of how anti-Zionist uh, discourse uh, 
is received by Israel's detractors and how it is turned into an alibi for anti-Semitism. Uh, and five, if I can get through this before you are all uh, back at home and asleep, um, I discuss the nature of the language of salvation engendered in this dialogue between Jewish anti-Zionists uh, and non-Jewish uh, radical opponents of uh, the existence of a Jewish state. And I will demonstrate, hopefully, that it is a dialogue essentially advocating a modern secular variant of conversion for Jews as an answer to the problem of anti-Semitism. Let me start from the perhaps most contentious point, the one about self-hatred. This label, of course, uh, is very contentious, uh, offensive, um, but uh, I think that it's still worth, worth using it, at least uh, in the academic context uh, uh, in which it is discussed. Um, the psychological and discursive component of Jewish self-hatred has been addressed in one key academic study uh, by um, Sander Gilman in 1986 in a book called Jewish Self-Hatred, and it was previously addressed in a very uh, peculiar, uh, albeit very interesting pamphlet published by an Italian exiled anarchist, Camillo Berneri, in 1935 in Paris, uh, in a book that uh, he titled Le Juif Antisemite, the, Antisem the Antisemitic Jew. Let me start with Berneri. Berneri sought to explain self-hating Jews and by the way, the date is interesting because, of course, uh, anti-Semitism was very much acceptable at the time, and this was bef well before, of course, the creation of the State of Israel. Um, Berneri sought to explain self-hating Jews by documenting the historical recurrence of this phenomenon, and then explaining it as a typical act of neophyte zeal and the result of a burning desire to burnish their credentials as new Christians. He mentioned Jewish converts to Christianity, like Pablo Cristiani, who led medieval trials against the Talmud uh, in 13th century Spain, and Alfonso de Valladolid, who wrote ferocious anti-Jewish polemics in the 14th century. And these converted Jews uh, not only became Catholics, uh, which happened to many uh, in those times, but they were also actively and publicly anti-Jewish, placing their knowledge of Judaism at the service of anti-Jewish causes. The Catholic Church, noted Berneri, used them as proof of the fallacy of the Jewish faith. Now, Berneri, interestingly, doesn't think that they were anti-Semites. He says that it's much more complicated than that. Uh, and his argument is basically that the self-haters wish to bring their erstwhile co-religionists to embrace the new truth they had found, and resented them for failing to see it. So this conflicted sentiment of love, I want you to see the truth, and hate, how can you not see the truth, informs the relation of the neophyte with his former community, but also with a novel group of reference because it is through the zeal he displays in the pursuit of the new truth that the sincerity of his conversion is proven. Gilman substantially concurs with, essentially concurs with this analysis. There is nothing novel or unique about Jews, Jews joining anti-Jewish hostility. And I quote from his book, to be accepted in society means acquiring the reference group's discourse. This problem did not suddenly appear with the emancipation of the Jews in the 18th century. It is a problem inherent in the existence of the Jews in the diaspora, a problem of exile. So Gilman explains Jewish self-hatred as a Jewish preoccupation with self-image, a preoccupation shared by other minorities. This preoccupation is made particularly pressing for a minority living in the midst of a community that negatively depicts uh, depicts it and blames it for some, if not all, the social ills. Gilman contends that at some point the minority's perception of self is conditioned by the way the majority perceives the minority. Jews, in other words, come to see themselves as they are viewed by the majority of people amidst whom they live. So if all of them or many of them are anti-Semites, uh, eventually that perception of the Jew will start to percolate in the, in the uh, self-conscious of, of the Jewish community. The more negative the image of the Jew is, and the more that view negatively affects the existence of the Jew, the more pressure the Jew feels to accept that view as a reflection of the truth. Eventually, some Jews conclude that the stereotype view of the Jew is an accurate reflection of reality, and they end up embracing it. The consequence is an effort to then distance oneself 
from it in order to regain acceptability within mainstream society. This metamorphosis, of course, comes with a price. It produces, in Gilman's words, a, quote, fragmentation of identity, or, quote, a double bind that leaves the Jew who breaks away from the Jewish people and joins the dominant group by, do by embracing its stereotyping of the Jews caught in no man's land. The outcome of this double bind, according to Gilman, is the constant effort to recreate a positive image of the other that is acceptable to the stereotype and that can be distinguished from the negative stereotype. And I quote again, in discovering what the Jew is supposed not to be, some sense of the constantly changing definition of the true Jew can be evolved. As Jews react to the world by altering their sense of identity, what they wish themselves to be, so they become what the group labeling them as other has determined them to be. The group labeling the other is able successfully to elude their stereotype and the reality to which it is supposed to relate, since the other reacts to the stereotyping as if it were a valid set of prescriptive categories of its identity. Let me just translate this. The anti-Semites create a negative image of the Jew. The Jew is dirty, he's genetically flawed, the Jew is greedy, the Jew, all of these things. This image has troubling consequences for the Jewish existence. Lost opportunities, social ostracism, marginalization, discrimination, a precarious existence, persecution, and in extreme cases, annihilation. Eventually, some Jews who don't enjoy this particular status given to them by society, conclude that anti-Semites are right in depicting the Jews the way they do. The stereotype, in other words, becomes reality for them. And those Jews who reach this conclusion must also conclude that they only have themselves to blame for their own suffering. To extricate themselves from this position, they abandon Judaism, or in modern times, those aspects of Judaism that the dominant stereotype considers negative. By doing so, they hope to regain the respectability and the privilege the privileges that they were previously denied on account of being Jewish or adhering to that specific element of Jewish identity that the surrounding environment considers to be uh, negative. So having projected uh, upon themselves the negative image of prejudice, they now free themselves from it by dumping it onto other Jews who have not yet undertaken the process <coughs> of conversion. They also develop an alternative definition of Jewish identity that is at home with the discourse of the dominant group and that separates them from the bad Jews, quote unquote, namely the ones who haven't discarded yet their old identity. In the current circumstances, the, res the reference group views Israel as the element of Jewish identity that needs to be discarded. Those who refuse end up being traitors of authentic Judaism, one that is devoid of any connection to the land of the state or the state of Israel, and which makes uh, Jews who embrace this view acceptable to the reference group. Now, the people who embrace this view will reject the accusation of self-hatred. As Gilman explains, quote, one of the most successful ways to distance the alienation produced by self-doubt is negative projection. By creating the image of a Jew existing somewhere in the world, who embodied all the negative qualities feared within oneself, one could distance the specter of self-hatred, at least for the moment. Now, Gil Gilman here was referring to the uh, phenomenon of, uh, of uh, the invention of the Eastern Jew uh, in 19th century Germany uh, among assimilating Jews, who, of course, you know, saw themselves by embracing German uh, uh, Hauptkultur uh, as the authentic Jews and despised the Ur student who were coming from the East and uh, who reminded them of customs and beliefs uh, which had made them uh, unacceptable to German uh, society. Uh, but I think that you can take this and apply it to different contexts uh, uh, other than the one of late 19th century German. The phenomenon of negative projection is, in my view, at work today with many anti-Zionist Jews. They view themselves as quote-unquote good Jews because they have broken away from their Zionist brethren and they have created an alternative, one that they call more authentic form of Jewish identity. Their version of being Jewish in the world is at peace with the dominant views of their reference group. 
and enables them to loathe the bad Jews who have so far failed to see the truth of the evil of Zionism in the world without having to break away from their Jewish background. Having established themselves as real and good Jews, they can also claim that their stance against Israel, often assumed in the name of Jewish value, helps fight anti-Semitism at the same time by convincing non-Jews that not all Jews support Israel. So let me go to step two, the coterminous nature of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Now the phenomenon of dissociation that I have described, uh, um, in my view, appears under the rubric of anti-Zionism, but I want to spend a few minutes discussing whether the two terms, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, can be synonymous. Because most, even the most fervent and virulent critics of Israel will reject accusations of anti-Semitism, um, especially if they come uh, from the political tradition of the left. They always argue that their animus is directed at Zionism, not Jews as a whole, and of course, often, and offer, often offer a list of prominent people with Jewish names who support their views as evidence that some of their best friends are Jewish, some of the people who think the same way as they do are Jewish, and therefore their arguments cannot possibly be defined um, as, as anti-Semitism. Now, their argument usually goes along this follow, the following lines. One, Israel is a betrayal of Judaism and is therefore un-Jewish or anti-Jewish. Two, growing numbers of Jews have come to the realization that point one is correct. Three, championing the dissolution or demise of Israel is therefore a cause that all Jews should embrace in the name of the authentic values of Judaism. And four, therefore anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. Now, it might be a little far-fetched to argue that anti-Zionism expresses affection for Judaism as a set of values and for the Jews as a social group, especially when it is intent on advocating the demise of the only Jewish state on earth. Um, but I think it's an, it's, a, it's an issue that has to be taken very seriously because most anti-Zionists will genuinely express outrage if you accuse them of, of being anti semitic now, anti-Zionism is a term that is deliberately uh, used in a very liberal, all-encompassing, and some, somewhat undefined fashion these, day, these days. And when applied inaccurately, it may be mistaken to include criticism of Israel. Um, it is helpful, therefore, to define what it means. And, and in order to define anti-Zionism, you therefore need to define what anti-Zionism is against, namely Zionism. So let me just define Zionism with four uh, in four points. Zionism makes four crucial claims. One, the Jews are a collective, bestowed with the distinct features of a nation in the modern secular sense. Two, the diaspora condition, living in exile, is defective, both because of the dangers it entails for a vulnerable minority and because of the impediments it causes in the creation and development of a genuine national culture. Three, a national project leading to at least national autonomy and at best national sovereignty is therefore desirable. And four, this project has a worldly goal, namely the achievement of extensive social results and continuous social development. It is not a religious project. Now, territoriality is an essential component of Zionism, but it is not the only one. Zionism claims that a nation can fulfill its destiny and display its full potential only within the confines of the nation state. And these conditions for Jews require that the scattered communities of the diaspora in gather, to use the biblical term, to live within a newly formed Jewish policy, polity. Now, as an essentially secular movement, Zionism therefore advocated not just statehood, but also the creation of an independent society, the revival of the language, the growth of a distinctive national culture and national life, and through the development of an independent Jewish society, the return of the Jewish people to a condition of normalcy in the world, that is, the return of Jews to history as a people like all peoples, to use Herzl's phrase. Now, if you take this definition of Zionism, and therefore this is what anti-Zionists pose, then you must conclude that anti-Zionism goes well beyond criticism of Israeli policies. It's not just about occupying the West Bank, um, or using force to quell the Intifada, or conducting uh, uh, you know, uh, targeted assassinations 
of leaders uh, of Hamas. It is opposing the revival of a collective Jewish existence defined in its own terms uh, within the context of a modern nation state. Anti-Zionism fundamentally denies either the right or the desirability of the Jewish people to define themselves as a nation with all the attendant social and political consequences of nationhood. Anti-Zionism not only opposes the creation and continued existence of a sovereign independent Jewish state, but also rejects the idea that the Jews are a people and as such are, at least in principle, entitled to self-determination. Even when it recognizes that Jews may be a distinct collective, it still postulates that it is in the Jews' best interest to remain in a diaspora community, extolling the myth of Jewish powerlessness in history as a moral quality and a trait that Jews would do well to keep, rather than compromising it through the pitfalls of state. Anti-Zionism attacks the expression of Jewish identity through identification with Israel by denying that authentic Jewish identity has any linkage to Israel, by denying that Jews are a nation, by denying that as a nation they enjoy the rights of other nations, or by assuming that the implementation of their right will invariably yield an immoral outcome, and only in the last instance by criticizing Israel's actions on their merits. Israel's conduct, even of the worst kind, is for anti-Zionists a symptom of the evil they fight, not its essence. Therefore, anti-Zionists expect Jews to join them in their fight against Zionism and to do so for their own interest. Inasmuch as some Jews do join them, a Jewish presence in their ranks acts as a shield against any kind of accusation that their activism is anti-Semitism. Thus, the crucial ingredients that make anti-Zionism a cover for anti-Semitism is the postulate according to which Zionism is a betrayal of Jewish values and is inherently evil. And seen in these terms, anti-Zionism becomes almost like a Jewish moral obligation to save the Jews from themselves. For Jewish anti-Zionists, this argument helps them claim that they and not the Zionists are the standard bearers of authentic Judaism. For non-Jewish anti-Zionists, the same argument also works. To claim that Zionism as a betrayal of Judaism offers them and their rhetoric a shield against any type of accusation of anti-Semitism. If Israel is perceived as evil, both for its conduct, but also for its essence as a nation state, based on an ethno-religious identity that Jews, because of their history um, and their traditions, should reject, then it becomes obvious that uh, uh, the only option that uh, Jews have to remain true to their heritage would be to embrace anti-Zionism and uh, oppose Israel. And here, therefore, lies the nexus between anti-Zionism and present-day anti-Semitism. A significant part of contemporary Jewish communities considers Israel as part of their Jewish identity. And at any rate, at least half of the Jewish people live in Israel. Yet their attachment to Israel is chastised for two reasons. First, because anti-Zionists postulate that Israel should cease to exist as a Jewish state, because its existence is bad for its neighbors. And second, because the manifestation of Jewish sovereignty is described as contrary to the authentic elements that make up Judaism and therefore is supposedly bad for the Jews. And this double assumption therefore engenders hostility towards any Jew who will identify with Israel. And it also puts pressure on Jews to conform to these assumptions. If unheeded, such pressure may have negative consequences for careers, for self-esteem, and sometimes even for their physical well-being. Now, this leads a number of Jewish intellectuals to engage in what I would call Jewish confessions. And that's the third step of my presentation. And since I am only halfway through my lecture, um, I think I will skip this and just take you to the point, uh, the fifth point uh, in my five-step <coughs> argument um, uh, about um, the the argument that um, the argument that um, rejecting Zionism is the most authentic expression of Jewish identity, uh, and the um, 
overlapping of this argument with the call for a, uh, a Jewish, a type of Jewish conversion. Now, once we assured that not all Jews embrace Zionism, anti-Semites will take anti-Zionist Jews and use them both as a stick to beat all other Jews and as a shield to fend off accusations of anti-Semitism. Let me give you an example uh, of, of this kind of argument. Uh, an article by British historian and columnist Max Hastings, who, discussing Jewish support for Israel in 2002, so in, in the midst of the, or at the height of the Second Intifada, wrote the following, quote, If Israel persists with its current policies and Jewish lobbies around the world continue to express solidarity with repression of the Palestinians, then <coughs> genuine anti-Semitism is bound to increase. Herein lies the lobbyists' recklessness. By insisting that those who denounce the Israeli state's behavior are enemies of the Jewish people, they seek to impose a grotesque choice. The Israeli government's behavior to the Palestinian breeds a despair that finds its only outlet in terrorism. No one can ever criticize the Jewish diaspora for asserting Israel's right to exist, but the most important service the world Jews can render to Israel today is to persuade its people that the only plausible result of their government behavior is a terrible loneliness in the world. Now, Hastings' word may appear reasonable, certainly in that context, but a closer look shows that they're anything but undiluted anti-Semitism. First, Hastings blame anti-Semitism on Jewish support for repression of the Palestinians. Now, one is hard-pressed to find, quote-unquote, Jewish lobbying expressing support for repression of the Palestinians. Hastings' first point, then, is a casual demonization or extreme mischaracterization of Israel as an oppressor and of Israel's supporters as morally callous and moral accomplices to this oppression. Hastings then commits a second mistake in my view. Without a single shred of evidence, he claims that Israel's defenders demonize those who criticize Israel's behavior. He thus sets up a straw man that makes his extreme characterization of Jewish groups sound reasonable. In short, he blames the Jews for Israel's actions, blames the Jews for anti-Semitism that invariably follows from those actions in his view, and blames the Jews for being shrill and uncritical in their defense of Israel, exculpates Palestinian terrorism for being the inevitable consequence of Israel actions, and, of course, in the end, blames the Jews if they suffer as a consequence. Now, he's never written anything about so-called Arab lobbies in the world or, or, or refrain from blaming anti-Muslim sentiment on Muslim actions. And I'm not saying that you should, but I think that it is an interesting parallel. I, ha I have yet to see anyone uh, uh, describing attacks, racially based attacks on Muslims as the inevitable consequence of Muslims failing to denounce, you know, Islamic inspired terrorism or blaming Muslims for the suffering that they get as a result of what their co-religionist far away in another place in the world uh, decide to do on any given day. Now Hastings returned on this theme two years later in 2004, um, after, actually 2005, after Israel had completed its withdrawal from Gaza, after Israeli elected voters had chosen a centrist government committed to a state solution while the Palestinian people had elected Hamas uh, as their government. He writes the following, quote, Younger Europeans, not to mention the rest of the world, are more skeptical about Israel's territorial claims. They're less susceptible to moral arguments about redress for past horrors, which have underpinned Israeli actions for almost 60 years. So when Israel thought about building the uh, national water carrier in 1965, that was, uh, you know, the Holocaust was used as an argument. When Israel uh, um, decided to... Uh, bring in uh, uh, you know, 150 boat people from Vietnam in 1977, uh, you know, uh, past horrors underpinned Israeli actions and so on. So everything in the last 60 years. However, he says, no, then he says, we may hope that it will never become respectable to be anti-Semitic. However, Israel is discovering that it can no longer frighten non-Jews out of opposing its policies merely by accusing them of anti-Semitism, end of quote. Another influential European intellectual, former Italian ambassador to the USSR and columnist for the leading Italian daily, Mr. Sergio Romano, suggested uh, that Jews use the Holocaust and anti-Semitism as tools for political blackmail. 
he equated frequent outcries about the return of anti-Semitism, this was 2004, to the Spanish Inquisition and said, quote, there is in the world today a tribunal of anti-Semitism that apparently sits permanently in session and who can summon anyone to give account of their words and feelings. Now, ISGAP had not been established yet, so I don't think he was referring to, uh, to Charles uh, and his, uh, his efforts. Um, but at the time of his writings, there were several reports uh, about European anti-Semitism. One had been commissioned by the French Interior Ministry and written by a prominent French non-Jewish public figure, Mr. Jean-Christophe Ruffin. One had been written by the U.S. Uh, Department of State. Uh, one had been drafted by the European Union Monitoring Center Against uh, Racism, Antisemitism, and Xenophobia, an institution of the European Union. Um, and then there were several uh, reports by the Anti-Defamation League. So if you take all of these institutions and their reports, I guess only the ADL qualifies, uh, at least in Romano's eyes, as an example of a Jewish Inquisition in charge of ascertaining the index of Antisemitism. One must ask, I think, how all other institutions and organizations engaged in monitoring, recognizing the threat, monitoring it, uh, and trying to combat it uh, belong to this Jewish Inquisition. Um, this is just another example, I think, of, of setting a straw man to actually shrug uh, both the problem and the accusation. And the problem, I think, is that uh, oftentimes these intellectuals have uh, a, a marked discomfort for the notion of, um, of Jewish statehood, of the moral implication of Jews being masters of their own destiny, for better or worse. Um, their appeals express a preference for a Jewish people that are at the mercy of history, not masters of their own destiny. In the simplistic binary terms employed uh, by these arguments, such mastery inevitably entails a role inversion from victim to aggressor that will naturally trigger anti-Semitism. In the view of these scholars and intellectuals, Jews are deserving of sympathy as victims. But as they see it, Jewish statehood not only entails the loss of innocence that supposedly characterized Jewish existence before Israel establishment, but its actions also justify, trigger, and justify anti-Jewish sentiment. So this morbid fascination with Jews denouncing Israel takes many forms. And in my paper, I have, I don't know, about 10, 12 pages of examples. Um, I just want to focus on one last point to conclude. And that is the theological dimension of this argument. Um, because if, in light of all of what I've said so far, um, if, if all of what I've said so far is, is compelling enough, then one must ask uh, what kind of Jews should emerge as the standard bearers of Jewish identity. And the answer, I think, is readily available in these texts that I've been quoting tonight. Exalting the Jew as a victim offers the right balance to contend uh, uh, for the muscular Jews who fights back, the Zionist Jew. In other words, those who extol victimhood as quintessentially Jewish frequently demonize Israel for being at the polar opposite of this model. Zionism, according to this view, is a perversion of Jewish humanism. I'll give you one example. The American Jewish theologian, Mark Ellis, states, quote, while it is clear that the creation and expansion of Israel has been an end is a catastrophe for the Palestinians, and you know, we can argue whether this is true, not true, but I don't think that there's anything essentially anti-Semitic in this first part of his sentence. Let me just continue. He says, the use of power by Jews to displace and denigrate the Palestinians has also been a severe trauma for Jewish history and the contemporary Jewish community. Ellis, in other words, does not only embrace the post-Zionist version of Israel's history as fact, but decries its consequences on Jewish history and the contemporary Jewish community, thus suggesting that the Jewish return to history as an independent nation has had a corrupting influence on the moral character of the Jews. Zionism abandoned the historic posture of Jewish passivity in the face of persecution and affirmed their Jewish right to self-defense. By doing so, it put Jewish self-preservation above any morality supposedly inherent in victimhood. And by its recourse to force to protect its right to self-determination, Israel, a sovereign state, will always inevitably face the sometimes impossible moral dilemma 
of those who seek to reconcile the amorality of national interest <coughs> with Jewish morality. This dilemma is made more acute by Jewish history, given that historically Jews were often the victims of that amorality. The current anti-Semitism relies on Jews to go beyond the moral questioning of specific actions because of this acute awareness of the historical dilemma that they confront. Um, relying on the claims put forward by Israel's post-Zionist scholars <coughs> and anti-Zionist intellectuals, uh, this argument basically tries to prove that Zionism engendered a loss of innocence for the Jewish people. And once the consequences of renewed Jewish sovereignty are depicted in such terms, they can then be used as evidence that Jewish nationalism is inherently evil. In other words, not the specific actions and conduct ordered by the Israeli government in this or that circumstance may be questionable, uh, distasteful, or downright evil, but that the very essence of Israel's existence is evil in and of itself. Jewish critics of Zionism, therefore, do not make support for a Jewish state conditional upon a morally irreproachable conduct. Though in practice, a Jewish state would always fail their test, um, they could at least be amenable to the idea in utopian terms. They could say, you know, if Israel behaved in, an error, in a morally irreproachable fashion, we, we could entertain the idea uh, of supporting it or not opposing it, uh, but Israel will always fail to meet the standards of utopia. But they go further. They seek moral solace in the redemptive notion of a return to innocence through the abandonment of Zionism and discarding of its consequences. It is doubtful whether an honest assessment of the historical facts would therefore matter to them. It is also undeniable that their unbearable sense of guilt does not stop at the gates of historical truth and feeds largely on scholarly works that have been driven by uh, an ideological agenda. One that relies on a fantasy about a lost primeval state of innocence for the Jewish people, um, and which develops therefore its own version of the ideal Jews. And what is the ideal Jew in this notion? He or she has no motherland, is a wandering marrano and a revolutionary with political loyalties that are usually progressive, is fully assimilated and yet conscious of a Jewish past. Today, Jews are more easily integrated into the narrative of the modern Western world as previous victims rather than members of a sovereign nation in arms. Especially in the current age of general prosperity, multilateral diplomacy, constitutional orders that prescribe war, to appear in the nationalistic martial role that Israel assumes is to appear, quote-unquote, anachronistic in Tony Judd's famous rendition. The only uncontroversial way to express a proud Jewish identity is therefore through the sensitive embodiment of suffering and victimization from the past, and also through the modern expression of the prophetic tradition, the way that is intellectual defined, namely, as a dissident intellectual. These are held forth as the positive Jewish role models in sharp contrast to the Zionist model, which is chastised for having betrayed Western values and a certain notion of Jewish identity. Which is why a lot of these people go as far as actually embracing a language borrowed from uh, Christian theology and salvation language to describe the process. Let me give you a, a few examples. Um, I will spare you the quotes from uh, uh, the gentleman who resigned from the Jewish people from the pages of Tikkun. Um, um, Michael Lerner? No, that was Bertolt uh, uh, Ullman. Um, but where is the example? Never. Well, the first example, of course, is Benny Morris himself, uh, the noted new historian who wrote in his book about, uh, uh, about uh, the 1948 war uh, that Israel's uh, uh, establishment could be considered as, quote, an original sin. And I quote from his, uh, his writings, how one perceives 1948 bears heavily on how one perceives the whole Zionist experience. If Israel, the heaven of a much persecuted people, was born pure and innocent, that it is worthy of the grace, material assistance, and political support showered upon it by the West over the past 40 years, and worthy of more of the same years to come. If, on the other hand, Israel was born tarnished, besmirched by original sin, then it was no more deserving of that grace and assistance than were its neighbors." End of quote. 
Now, Morris subsequently attributed these theological terms to other, and while his former fellow traveler, Avi Schlein, denied that the term had ever been used, he quickly ridiculed the notion that Israel's creation might have been equally been, quote, an immaculate conception, another Catholic theological concept closely correlated to the notion of sin. Yet, it was the same Schlein who more recently expanded the vocabulary of Christian salvation by deriding Israel on the grounds that the Jewish state wished to have both, quote, 30 pieces of silver and, quote, the crown of thorns, a clear reference, of course, to Judas and the Jesus of the Passion. Now, how does Israel re restore its lost innocence? By a process of political and moral rehabilitation that will save Jews from the evil inherent of Zionism and by the abandonment of Zionism itself. The argument that the Jewish state was born in sin is central to the notion of rehabilitation. And again, think about what it means in theological terms to be born uh, in sin. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, quote, original sin may be taken to mean the sin that Adam committed, or two, a consequence of this first sin, the hereditary stain with which we're born on account of our origin or descent from Adam. The same theology traditionally postulates that the only salvation from original sin could be provided by baptism, which for Jews means the conversion to Christianity. So if at the individual level a Jew can be saved from original sin through baptism and conversion, what would be the baptism equivalent for Israel? And that is, of course, the abandonment of Zionism, the essence of, of evil as it is described by these intellectuals, Ridding Israel of its Jewish nature will provide the equivalent. By ceasing to be Jewish, the state of the Jews, rather than Jews as individuals, will be granted forgiveness and salvation, will be redeemed from the damnation that a pre-baptism condition would have guaranteed, and washing away the state of the original sin will restore their innocence, which somehow, in the mind of these critics, characterized Jewish existence prior to Israel's establishment. And there are many examples of this kind of language from uh, Avishai Margalit writing in, the, uh, in Harper Magazine uh, an essay entitled Saving Israel from Itself, uh, to Tony Judd, of course, uh, uh, calling for Israel to convert to a binational state. He used that very word uh, in, his, uh, in his analysis. And it's interesting, by the way, he says, in a world where nations and people increasingly intermingle and intermarry at will, the cultural and national impediments to communication have all but collapsed. But more and more of us have multiple elective identities and would feel falsely constrained if we had to assert answer to just one of them. In such a world, Israel is truly an anachronism. And not just an anachronism, but a dysfunctional one. In today's clash of cultures between open pluralist democracies and belligerently intolerant faith-driven ethnostates, Israel actually risks falling into the wrong camp. Now, why is this something that offers an alibi to anti-Semitism? Was Tony Judd an anti-Semite? I don't think he was. But let me just give you, to conclude, in a, a sense and a glimpse into why I think um, this was so problematic. If nothing else, because he was singling out the Jews of all people for this kind of, of conversion and move away from anachronism. Judd was a critical scholar of nationalism in his, in his scholarly writings. Um, but he also had no illusions about the viability of alternatives. In his celebrated book, A Grand Illusion, an Essay on Europe, written a few years before the essay he wrote in the New, in the New York Review of Books about Israel having to convert, he actually celebrated the nation state. Quote, the only remaining as well as the best adapted source of collective and communal identification. End of quote. As for Europe, he summarily dismissed the European effort to paper over national identities and transcend them uh, as if it was a pipe dream. And he said, from Spain to Lithuania, the transition from past to present is being recalibrated in the name of a European idea that is itself a historical and illusory product. But what will not necessarily follow is anything remotely resembling continental political homogeneity and supranational stability. In other words, he thought that nationalism was good. It was the viable model for a political function, a functioning political unit. For everybody, except for the Jews. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. It was excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So we have some uh, Q&A. So well, I, I, I don't want to Q&A. I want to, I want to, I want to plug Emmanuel's essay yes. uh, at the... Uh,
there's a book by that added by Abu Mahmud called Research on Feminism. And Emmanuel's essay um, in that essay, he says that, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, he said that all the old 47 pages that you didn't get to hear <laughs> is there, and it's filled with evidence and brilliant analysis and clarity that is absolutely uh, spectacular. So um, thank, you. thank you for sharing it with us. So, I'll ask you a question. Please. <coughs> so first of all, your paper is very important and the presentation was excellent. Um, I keep updating it, by the way. They, yeah, it's very easy, by the way. I updated music. mine yesterday. Mm. Say it again? Never ends. I, I, I'm not, you know, I, it's very easy. Every day there's something. Yes. yes. So my, uh, my question is this. So your analysis, I think, is excellent. On the other side of the Israeli boundary, there is chaos of reactionary barbarism, right? In terms of uh, democracy, civil rights, human rights, freedom of press, access to education and health care, the rights of women, the rights of gay people, religious pluralism, it's a catastrophe that is just becoming more of a catastrophe. Can you comment on this profound hypocrisy in the academy, which we're supposed to re represent critical scholarship, pursuing human rights, uh, creating stronger civil society, the like. How do scholars, you know, with all the contradictions and problems of Israeli society, and there are, how do scholars create such this environment in which we function where there's this horrific critique in some quarters of Israel where they want to destroy Israel, yep. get rid of Israel, and yet on the other side of the boundaries there is from a liberal human rights uh, enlightened perspective, there's darkness. It's it's a great question, and I'm just uh, I'm not ignoring you while you were asking the question. I'm just trying to find the uh, the perfect quote <laughs> to answer uh, <laughs> to answer your observation. And, and the answer is that um, this is not an argument about you know what Israel should do. It's not an argument about how how to make uh, the Middle East a better place. It's not it's none of that. This is an argument about Jewish identity. So what, whatever happens out there, it's, we don't care. It's about us. It's about how we define ourselves, how the broader community looks at us. Um, you know, for example, um, um, you know, just, just to, to, to sort of uh, you know, to relate to what, what you were saying, um, 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 the, the person I'm looking for is, uh, is, is Jerome Slater, who has you know spent a lifetime trying uh, uh, trying to somehow promote peace and dialogue and uh, you know in many ways uh, he's a he's a very commendable uh, uh, individual for his intentions um, but when you read his analysis and uh, admittedly the one that I'm about to quote is a little dated it's obvious that whatever the Arab world the Palestinians uh, the region does or doesn't do is immaterial. It's as if context did not matter. Um, in a book he wrote entitled Creating a Palestinian State, this is what he says. Because the Jews are representative of all human suffering, okay, now I don't know how he reached that conclusion and I'm not so sure the Jews want to be to sort of take that, that role, but anyway, the story of the Jews is uh, allegorically the story of the Palestinians. And in the end, the encounter of the Jews and the Palestinians is the encounter of each people with itself at another point in time. For the Jews of Israel, the Palestinians of today, and especially the Palestinian victims of tomorrow's expulsion, which hasn't happened yet, but he expected it, are all the Jewish victims of history. And for the Palestinians, the Jews of Israel are what a suffering people becomes when he becomes a state. They are the potential, they are impotential Palestinians of a possible future. So, I mean, it takes a few hours to actually disentangle what it is that he is actually saying. What he's basically saying is, you know, I don't care about what is happening out there. there. But what is happening out there has moral implication about my own identity. That's what I care about. And that's what the debate is about. The debate is not about what Israel should, shouldn't do, you know, should you order this, should you order that, you know, when people, I'll just give you an example, people say, you know, this is not anti-Semitism, it's just I'm criticizing Israel. Criticism of Israel is not anti-Semitism. Do they mean all criticism? Because I criticize Israel a lot. You know, I, for example, I think that uh, you know, Ariel Sharon used too much restraint when he was prime minister. That was a criticism I had. 
that's not the criticism they have in mind. They have a very different kind of criticism in mind. It's always a criticism that usually is to the left of the most liberal segments of the Israeli political uh, spectrum. So it's a straw man. And it is about really how what happens there reflects on me here. It is how will I cope when I go to my uh, sociology de department faculty meeting um, and people will talk about Israel. How does that reflect on me? Which in a way is very petty. Because what happens over there has implications for the lives of millions of people. Um, so that's the answer. The answer is that this is not a debate about how best to serve you know, the aspirations and rights and desires and well-being of the peoples of the region. It is about how we see ourselves and how others perceive us in this society. So I'm going to ask a follow-up question, but I'll be very brief and please respond briefly because I don't want to take up all the time. But I'm going to push you a little bit. Sure. In my work, when I looked on the history of anti-Semitism, racism, colonialism, I place greater emphasis on not focusing on the victims, but focusing on the dominant ideology uh, and values, if you will, of the society. And how a society can reach a point where it becomes racist and imposes racist policies or colonial policies or anti-Semitic policies. So if Jews on the Upper West Side or in sociology departments are feeling pressure some individuals can stand up and fight the pressure, some will succumb to it, some want to fit in, they want to get career advancement, they can be selfish, they can be weak, who knows. But can you comment on maybe the state of affairs in academia, the dominant environment in which we function? And some of us fight. I left so academia, that's my comment. And we are all being uh, shown the door. That's how brief I will be. Okay. Yes. I want to respond to it because it's something, you know, the, the American Standard Association, the boycott resolution. Um, and, you know, that Fordham is still um, negotiating what to do, and I don't know if anything will be done. But I want to point out that one of the um, most discouraging things about it for um, those of us on the faculty who were appalled by it was that um, nobody who was not Jewish did not protest it. In other words, only, only Jewish members of the faculty. And you know, there's a lot to be said, to the argument about boycotts. I mean, boycotts are, it's intellectually, you can be opposed to boycott and be non-Jewish. I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot to be said about the just in principle of academic freedom. Um, it was very, you know, it was very depressing. Um, it's, uh, so. I agree. I want it ask a question, but I do just want to make one point with respect to what you were asking. The problem is, is when government fails us, and I, I know some of these professors who do not want to speak up in Brooklyn College because they know that the normal power that, that typically would be on their side, the Department of Education, the Civil Rights Commission, now these are in control of really a very left-wing anti-Israel agenda. So I, I, I mean, I'm not involved in academia, but I think that when there's nowhere to turn and there's a cynicism and a nihilism that arises that after a while you do give up. But actually, my question to you, or a point I want to make, this was wonderful. I, I follow you, and I don't know if you've written any books. I came in late, but if you do, I'd like to read them. I attended the APAC conference, and just very briefly, I, I don't think they were expen expecting Dil Bill de Blasio to come. And when he came, he just said, basically, essentially, I'm your friend, you have a voice here, fine. I don't even particularly like Bill de Blasio. And I'm sure that you've heard about now this group of uh, liberal, reformed Jews, has been feminists, whatever, who were, you know, they've written a letter denouncing his appearance. Well, as anybody knows, APAC actually only advocates for what the government of Israel wants. But what's interesting to me is these anti-Semites, these self-hating Jews, they would never expect any other group to live by the standards by which Jews live by. In other words, if Bill de Blasio went to a Muslim group, if he went to a black group, and he said, my doors are open, I'm here to support you, let me know how I can help you, there would be no criticism. And yet, when it comes to Jews, the Jews never, the, the anti-Semitic Jews, they never 
expect any their own group to support themselves. And, and this is something that they find intolerable. So the standards that they impose on themselves, they would never impose on any other group. So I just wanted you to comment well, on that. I, thank you for your observation. I mean, one of the problems that you see in, in this kind of uh, environment is that you know, somehow, you know, Israel is always expected to meet the standards of utopia and be judged by them. Um, the, um, the, the, the problem with this pounding uh, of, of this argument is that eventually, um, um, sort of, you know, this is what I was describing, sort of how you know, pushed and, and, and pressured eventually you kind of end up uh, embracing the stereotype uh, as if it was true. One problem that I see is that oftentimes Jewish communities tend to succumb to this argument and, and play along. And I want to give you an example. The recent uh, polemic about uh, whether uh, you know supporters of uh, the boycott, uh, divestment, and sanctions women should be invited to speak uh, at Hillel. You know, the, the whole debate was framed in terms of you know not silencing critics or so sort of being, being having a pluralist platform. Now, with all due respect to Hillel, Hillel is not exactly the most mainstream speaker circle of America, right? I mean, it's not that if you can't hear a BDS supporter at Hillel, you will never hear a BDS supporter anywhere. The whole point of, of a free society with a plurality of voices is not that every small, that every and small club in every corner of the country must give a, you know, a platform to every single point of view. But isn't that right? exactly the argument that Brooklyn College uses to, yes. to invite the speakers? Or when Columbia had Ahmed did a job. Right. That's exactly That's right. the argument they use. Right. They say, listen, he's just a guy. That's just a speaker. Well, we have other speakers that speak on behalf of other things you that know, you might believe. Was it, was it uh, uh, what's his name, Barney Frank, who said last year in the whole controversy about uh, supporting or not supporting J Street, he said, you know, by, you know, sometimes having a, a, if your mind is too open, your brain will fall off, <laughs> right? And again, you know, I'm all in favor of, uh, of freedom of speech and giving a platform to anyone, uh, but, you know, it is entirely the right and I think also the duty in terms of an academic institution that is supposed to impart education to the new generations um, to put to, to establish some boundaries of what is acceptable. And again, you know, I'm sure that Ahmadinejad could have spoken at the, you know, uh, uh, at, the, at, the, at the luncheon organized by the Iranian embassy to uh, an audience of 300 people who could have been invited. And, and some of them were invited, and some of them chose to go, including journalists. And you know, when uh, one year he asked the Council of Foreign Relations uh, to to meet uh, New York leaders, and some of them chose to go, and that's fine. But I don't think that the right of free speech translates into an obligation to give a platform to anyone. So again, you know, if I want to hear, if I feel compelled to hear an advocate of uh, BDS. I don't have the automatic right to demand that my synagogue will invite one. You know, because I can go across the street, at, you know, I don't need to go to Hillel, I can cross the street and go to the Muslim Student Society, and they will have a BDS support, and I can hear it, and, and, the, and the Muslim Student Association will not deny me the right to attend. And that's how we should play the argument of free speech. So the fact that Hillel feels somehow compelled to be on the defensive and say, well, maybe under certain circumstances, and, and you have all these people saying, you can't deny them the right to appear before a Jewish audience because if you do so, you're denying them the right of free speech. No, their right of free speech is upheld every day in most forums, which, by the way, will never think once or even you know, twice about inviting a Zionist advocate, which this is the other thing, the asymmetry. We feel compelled somehow to invite the most extreme uh, deniers of Israel's right to exist in the name of free speech, when the opponents of Israel never feel compelled to invite the most ardent advocate of, say, the settlements to give his point of view or her point.
we fight this, sir? Sorry, really, there's a, sorry that the question in the back. Yes. Uh, so I know your focus is very much on uh, you know, the, the internal conversation amongst the Jews. Or, uh, I'm wondering whether you're aware of any systematic study that's been done of the ways and the works of Schlein, Morris, etc., uh, and the the, the anti-Semites that you're referring to uh, have been picked up and used as instruments by non-Jewish anti-Semites. Uh, whether that's been systematically looked at. Well, I mean, you know, again. I don't want to get into the whole polemic about uh, Walt and Mearsheimer, but uh, if, if you look at their, their their biography and their footnotes, that's that's what they use. That's exactly what they use, and, and you know, it's a in a way their 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 uh, their reference uh, the, the referenced work list and their footnotes is a who's who. Uh, of the uh, of the anti-Zionist uh, or post-Zionist uh, academic world, um, I can give you a, many other examples. I'll give you a, three examples, which I'm sure will resonate with you. Uh, the gentleman in the back uh, is an old friend from from Oxford. Uh, I, sh and, I should and, and I should, uh, <laughs> I should say. Admirer. So uh, the Oxford Student Union invites three Jews to advocate the, the motion. This house believes that Zionism is bad for the Jews, and three Jews to oppose it. And then it's so successful that a few months later, Intelligence Square, the you know August debating society in London, invites again three Jews to support and three Jews to uh, to oppose. And you know the six Jews confront one another in front of 800 cheering. You know, assorted Jews, Gentiles uh, of a variety of faith, persuasions, and, and opinions, and this is what you get. Now, you know, it, it's it's. Can you imagine in 21st century America somebody um, sort of uh, uh, saying, you know, let's have a debate at Intelligence Square about this house believes that uh, um, Black History Month is bad for African Americans. And uh, we have three African American intellectuals advocating in favor and three against. What would happen if, if Intelligence Square in New York did this? Let's just try to imagine. Or any other, pick any other ethnic group. But the Jews, it's a different story. And the fact that you have Jewish intellectuals volunteering to partake in this kind of uh, debates and this kind of discourse takes away any credibility to the to those who will say, look, this is actually bordering on anti-Semitism. Why is it bordering on anti-Semitism? You've got three Jews in favor, three Jews against. It's you know it's Jewish Jewish pluralism at play. So we have time for one more question because we're actually over time. Yes. But I think the next we'll have one question here, but I think the next debate should be are Jews descendants of apes and pigs or not? <laughs> <laughs> we should have a Muslim give the presentation. <laughs> One of the most common anti-Zionist narratives is that if the creation of Israel was very similar in its history to the creation of South Rhodesia or the creation of South Africa, in that you had colonists coming, setting up settlements, build, uh, creating, a, creating a community where effectively there was none uh, in the midst of a Palestinian society, and that was what, then that, that's what's creating the animosity, and that's why anti-Zionism is itself um, unredeemable, and that the binational state is necessary. How how do we respond to that um, and say and say that that there was a necessary creation of a Jewish state when it was a diasporic? Right, right. Well, I think that I mean the long answer would be to engage the historiographical historiographical debate, uh, which again has taken up a, a, a very ideological tinge over the years. Um, and has has led to the you know, marginalization of those historians who have uh, challenged the new historical the new historical trend uh, historiographical trends of the post-Zionist uh, uh, writings. Um, that would be the long answer. My short answer is: leave aside uh, the history of Israel's founding. Leave it aside, for example, for, for a moment. Israel is a reality. It's there. 
Is the binational state the way forward? If you ask, and this is where the South African comparison, even if you assumed that, Israel, that Zionism was a colonial movement, that the creation of Israel was comparable to South Africa, uh, um, and that, that uh, Israel is an apartheid state, even if you assume all of that. Ask Palestinians and Israelis if they want a binational state. And the answer you get overwhelmingly is, no, we want our own national state with them out of it as much as possible. And that's the bottom line. That's why it is so different. I mean, if everything else uh, left aside, the essence of this conflict still remains a clash between two opposing nationalism, nationalist movements, nationalist movements that claim an exclusive ownership of the same piece of land. And so even if the argument against Zionism based on a, a comparison to South Africa and apartheid, which I personally think is, is flawed because Israel is not treating Arabs the same way that you know, uh, uh, black Africans and Indians were treated in the apartheid system. But leaving that aside, it's still the essence of the struggle is not about the Palestinians saying we want to become Israelis, give us equal rights. It's not. There's a number of intellectuals who say that this is what is going to happen maybe possibly in the future. I personally think that if you were to create a binational state today, you would trigger a vicious civil war between two ethnic groups, the likes of which we have seen in the last 20 years, whether in the Balkans or what's happening now in Syria, which in the end would lead to one community cleansing ethnically the other. And judging by the military balance between the two, I can surmise who would have the upper hand. So I don't think that actually advocating a binational state, all, all else being equal, is a good idea. Because it goes against the desires of the two people to find a solution to their mutually exclusive demands and, and aspirations. Uh, and it creates that the, it's a recipe for more conflict. Okay, so I have two quick announcements. First, though, I'd like to thank Emmanuel very much for a very important day. Thank you. Two quick announcements. Our, our next event is Dr. Grabas, who's a leading scholar of international legal studies from Poland. She'll be here on March the 6th. On the screen sheets, you have all of our lists of events in uh, New York. And we just published a, a five-volume book that's available. There's a few sets here if anybody wants. And if you go to our website, you can order them from us or from Amazon anytime. It's a collection of about 75 articles of leading scholars and young up-and-coming uh, researchers. So it's on global anti-Semitism and I urge you to take a look. So thank you.